Good morning and um, welcome everybody to um, our webinar today brought to you by The Space. We're looking at filming and sharing a live performance when live really means live. That's what we're covering today. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction to The Space if you're not familiar with us as an organisation. I'm Linda Coburn and I'm the moderator today so I'm I work with The Space, which is the UK's digital commissioning and development agency for arts and the cultural sector. As explaining here that the core of our work is um, in commissioning digital projects and also in supporting the wider sector in terms of learning and development, lots of different ways. Um, and the webinar programme is a part of that. So the webinars are free and available to anybody in the sector. And we also have a program such as mentoring and um, an open calls. So um, today, I'll just give you a bit of an overview of what's going to happen and how we work. So here's the schedule. Um, we'll start by thinking about the, the spaces perspective on li real live capture with Natalie, who's one of our producers at the space and then has a massive experience working with all kinds of projects, uh, developing and producing projects. And then we'll hear from Martin Green from Lepus and Kat McGill from Live to Your Living Room about um, a live stream that they did of, uh, of Kelly, which we'll, they'll tell you more about. So you, you get to hear it from the, from the artist's point of view. What's this really like doing this work? What is it like for, a, for an arts, artist and an arts organization? And then after the break, um, Magnus Dennison um, will talk much. So Magnus has loads of um, experience in, in running uh, live streams for the space. And he'll really talk through some of the sort of practical and technical things that you need to think about when you're deciding, do I really want to go for this? Um, and all the way through uh, this, the session this morning, there is, so there's, there's talks and discussions and then lots of opportunity for questions if you have any questions, um, which we use, if you've been to any of our webinars before, we use the chat function for that. So you write your questions into chat and if it's for the people who are speaking, then I'll pick it up and feed the question to them at the right point. And if it's a more general question, our other speakers will be in the chat and people in the audience will have advice and ideas and recommendations for each other. So we use that really extensively. Um, and other useful things to know are that the session is recorded and then will be available on our website for a period of about six months afterwards and that we have a live captioner with us today, um, Jen. And so if you would, if live captions would be useful to you, you um, need to go to the link at the bottom of the Zoom screen and choose the option that you want. Okay, so that's really the, the, the schedule. I've told you about the speakers and what's going to happen today. Um, and before we go any further, I just want to um, invite Magnus to put his camera on and just give you a wave so you can see he's a real person he's here with us because uh, yeah so you don't need to say anything much at this point Magnus but because Magnus isn't on until after the break and he might have some uh, he may well have some useful um, input in the chat so just so that you know he's here so if you see this person talking away you'll hear from Magnus and you'll have a chance to ask him more more questions later on thank you for that okay um because uh, so what we're going to do now is go to Natalie, who's um, here uh, to represent the space today and she'll kick us off. So thank you, Natalie. And as I've said, you know, you're, you're a producer at the space and you worked on a wide, extensive range of capture projects. But today we're talking about the projects that are fully live. And I wondered if you can explain what exactly we mean by that. Yes, hi everyone, really great to be here. So yeah, today when we say live, what we mean is we're transmitting filmed content to a digital or broadcast audience in real time, i.e. at exactly the same time as that action is unfolding on stage. The reason it's good to get that definition out of the way is the majority of performance content that you see is as live or pre-recorded, which means there's some buffer time between filming and distributing that film performance. Now that might be only a few minutes or even a few seconds, or it might be several weeks or months. And that buffer time allows teams to, at a very minimum, deal with anything unexpected that happens during the live performance. 
um, and at a maximum allows them to create a more polished edit of that piece of work before the film goes to digital or broadcast audiences. Um, but today we're talking about what often gets referred to as live live and like the difference between going out and going out out um, the expectations should be quite different. I should also probably say at this point that at the space I am often encouraging people not to be truly live because if you are live there is a lot more pressure on every aspect of production on the performers on the technical team and who on whoever is manning the live stream itself so if there's more pressure and you've done away with your buffer why why would an organization or an artist opt to do that opt to do it this way so yeah, so despite that health warning, there are some productions that need to be or justify being truly live. And there's quite a big range of reasons for that. The first is that liveness creates its own electricity that can be really exciting for both the performers on stage and audiences at home. It's the same spark that you would get, that we get between performers and an audience in a room that can be kind of transmitted if you know something is live when you're watching at home. If you want to have any interactivity between your digital audiences and what's happening in the room, that may mean you need to be fully live in order to make that dialogue work. Or there may be another element of your particular show that will be editorially stronger if online audiences know that it's live. Liveness can make for a really exciting project. I just wanted to say up front that being live requires more rather than less resources and precision planning, which we're going to hear a bit more about today, is absolutely fun, will be absolutely fundamental to the success of a live project. It is worth also saying, perhaps conversely though, I think your audiences are more forgiving of accidents or glitches that happen when they know a show is genuinely live and there is a bit of headroom around quality if people feel they're getting something um, live and unmoderated and authentic. Live and authentic, thank you. So how do, how would an organisation make the decision? What are the sort of factors to think about? So I think the first thing to say is it's not necessarily an easy decision. Um, lots of different forces are going to come into play, editorial, logistical, technical, and of course, financial. May, they may all have a bearing on the decision. And thinking through some of those aspects is kind of what we're hoping to hear, both from our case study and Magnus today, what today's session is all about. But before I hand over, I would say that, that that decision that you've alluded to, Linda, does need to be made right at the start of planning filming because it will influence everything from your budget to how you market the piece, to how many people you need on site, every part of your production planning will be influenced by that decision. So other than um, do you have the rights to film this work, it's probably the biggest decision I ask teams that are looking to film a performance right, right at the top of their planning process. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to ask of the case studies whether that decision was made early on and, you know, and as you say, sort of really emphasising what you're saying. So we'll hear lots of different examples of how they made the decision later on, but early on, second most important decision. Thank you yeah. very much, Natalie. Okay, so um, you'll be again in, in chat and available for if people have questions, you'll be answering them in those and then you'll come back in when we reconvene the whole panel towards the end of the session. Thank you very much. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, so our first case study is, uh, we'll be looking at Kelly, which came live from the Lyceum with um, Martin Green, who is the creator of the piece and Kat McGill, who is his collaborator. I think that would be fair to say. Certainly they work in collaboration. Hello, both of you. And Good morning. Good morning, morning. So really we wanted to start, Martin, if you can just give us a quick overview of Kelly, what it is, and what the what this the live preview was all about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first we were doing this show uh, in the Lyceum, which is a, a presentation of a work in progress to a to a live audience, and the Lyceum, who are a theatre in Edinburgh, had commissioned the piece. So we knew that we would be in that building. 
and we knew that we were doing it at the specific time. So come jumping off what Natalie said about making that decision, is it going to be live? I think it was always important that this fitted in a very specific bracket. It was a ticketed event. Um, so, so we sort of, we had some answers to that. I've done quite a lot of work with, with Kat from Live to Your Living Room, who is here for me, but not for you people. Um, and uh, Kat and Live to Your Living Room, which we'll talk about more in a sec, do predominantly folk music, which is also my background. So although this was a slightly new thing, and it was certainly a bigger technical project than we'd done together before, doing things live um, is something Kat and I have, have done a lot of, and I think something that excites us both. So... Um, I won't talk too much now. I think we're going to see a, a clip now, uh, and then and then we'll we'll talk a bit more. Um, yeah. So this is this is Kelly. I'd never ever seen how anything was made before. Nothing gets made in my house, except for arguments and mess. Even food comes for boxes or Disney sometimes. But you know, in the band room, we did make things. We made great buildings of sound, huge cathedrals. But build up of pressure is unstable. And that means you can't predict what's going to happen. With the cornet, that meant sometimes the, the air flows beautifully through the mouthpiece and the note sings. And sometimes the air pisses at the side and the note splits. In my house, that pressure meant sometimes you go a cuddle and sometimes you go a smack. You just never know. The skill, the craft, is in controlling that pressure. So I really, I love that trailer because it sort of shows really what you were dealing with, doesn't it? You get the sense of that, those, that was taken directly from the live stream, I understand. Yes. So you can see you've got the the whole the full on the brass band and the performance going on there as well. Brilliant. Yeah, uh, the the captioning on on there was done after the event, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. So so you've um, Kat, Martin already said that you two have worked together before, um, but this was a different, a, a slightly working in a slightly different way. What what was new or different about it for you? Um, <laughs> pretty much everything <laughs> we started as so a large living room started off in lockdown as a as a way of uh, yeah kind of going back to that question about choosing live or, or not for us it was it was uh, built into our organization right from the start because we were responding to the fact that live music wasn't happening in lockdown so we were working with artists who were at home in their own home spaces using their own equipment that they had around them or in some cases posting equipment to them um and uh yeah just to, to try and keep some element of live music happening while everybody was was stuck at home then as things started to open up uh, we were getting a lot of messages saying please make sure that you keep doing this this is really accessible for me i've never seen so much live music and people were really kind of experiencing it as an event uh different to going out out but not less just different um and uh, and so yeah so martin and i've worked on worked on a few projects um we did a, a may morning at 5 a.m uh where we <laughs> we had about 200 people from all over the world tuning in to a zoom room uh to uh watch martin and uh, his friends doing some amazing dancing on the side of a Scottish hill <laughs> at stupid o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then, yeah, Martin came to us with this, with Kelly and said, do you want to, do you want to be involved? And we, we kind of, we jumped at the chance really. It was a massive project for us, much bigger than anything we'd ever done, but Martin's got an incredible team around him and the team at the Lyceum um, were all, were all really key in kind of making it happen and it was that it was that yeah communication and working together that was really essential to make it happen i mean martin can probably give you an idea of from your i mean from my end i was kind of just sat in front of a zoom screen 
uh, just like I always am. Uh, but, but Martin can probably give you a give you an idea of what so, it was like for you. So for just for sort of for clarity, so you you're the we're doing the kind of technical the streaming part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're working together, but you've got very clear roles in all of this. That's right, yeah. So yeah, Martin, uh, what was interesting on you about it for you? Well, and um, so one thing I would say is clarity of roles, which you just touched on, it becomes vital, yeah. I think, when, especially in real time. Um, and so one of the big things about Kat's role for us is, is not just technical, but also they have an audience and they actually have a, a different audience to the Lyceum who have a theatrical audience. And so that's quite exciting as well because um, what, what streaming allows you to do is to transplant your, your show to a different audience without having to bring them into a building. Um, and anyone that sells tickets knows it's really hard to get audiences to change. Folkies on the whole don't wanna to go to a theater, it, generally speaking. That doesn't make them narrow-minded. It's just not in their habits, you know? So, that was something that was very exciting. So, so Cat in a way becomes this very easy conduit for us to access a whole load of, of people. Um, and my experiences of live streaming have actually kind of gone hand in hand with Live to Your Living Room from the beginning of lockdown. So the first show that Cat and I ever did, which was very soon in lockdown, and I, I'm going to sing their praises a little bit because um, Cat's too modest and, and nice, but they jumped on it so quick at the beginning of lockdown that um, for audiences, but really importantly for musicians, though there weren't really other options at that point. So I think it was April, the first show that I did with uh, Live to Your Living, where they took the remarkably bold move of putting all of Oxford Folk Festival online, which now doesn't seem so crazy, but but two years ago, that, that was a massive decision. And the thing that made it so exciting, and we did it from my living room, and we did, I did it with, with my partner, and my kids got involved. The whole thing seemed really different and unusual, but at that point, it was literally a laptop, and, and a, I happened to own microphones, so, but I think I could have just done it with a laptop. I could have done it with a phone. It didn't seem at that point that production value was the exciting thing, and one of the things that's changed over time is we couldn't have done that Lyceum show off a phone. It wouldn't have felt right anymore. And so maybe we'll come back to that, but that definitely feels like a change. But the thing that stayed the same for me is it really is live. And so Natalie's question about how do you make that decision? I think from a performer's point of view, it makes a big difference. But from an audience point of view, I think it does as well. And I've been to a lot of live to live room shows as an audience member. And one of the amazing things about their shows is because they're on Zoom, I see friends of mine in the audience that I maybe haven't seen in person now for, for years, and especially in lockdown when we're not seeing people. And that is part of why we go out, I realised. We go out partly because you, you see these other people. And so that's only true where you have a, a medium of Zoom, for example, where you see the, the other punters. Um, but that was certainly something that, that I found very exciting. And I think, and I'll, and I'll throw it back to Kat, but I think it feels to me like you have sort of made a, a folk community online that, that must be used to seeing each other on Zoom now. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was just thinking when you were saying that, it was, it was one of the real, real big things right at the start was the connection and the community, because obviously in lockdown, people didn't, they were really missing that and i remember one of our quite early gigs um we we did uh, a band called vazen and they streamed from sweden and they had a they weren't in lockdown at the time so they went into the local arts center they had a big screen and i remember one of the performers saying as we were sort of um uh, debriefing afterwards you're saying I'm, I'm looking up at this big screen and i see my mum sitting next to my american agent sitting next to my good friend from japan and it, it kind of like it creates connections and it 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 drops drops the barriers between between people kind of getting together and so, seeing each other. So going on from that, this particular Kelly, this particular example, you were dealing with an or there was an audience, and I understand there's a different team producing the show in the Lyceum, but there's a live audience in the Lyceum. 
and then you're thinking and paying attention particularly Kat, to the people at home and what's going on for them what what did you need to think about to make all of that happen you know you're talking about the communication and the different teams but what were there, were there any particular sort of aspects of it that you really had to think about to make the most of what you had? Yeah, I mean, one of the first um, one of the first key things for us was that we didn't want the online experience to be a kind of secondary thing. We wanted to we wanted it to be on an on an equal level, if you like, with a with a in venue experience. We didn't want it to be like a sloppy seconds. So we we really put a lot of thought into kind of how to make that happen and. All of our events have um, a have an event host, so uh, which is essentially the role that you're doing today, welcoming the audience as they come in. We get people to write in the chat where they're watching from, um, and then the other thing that we do, which is quite unique to an online gig, is that we have a little section where we actually go and chat to the artists. So when they were in their home, this was quite normal we just did it as part of the gig but for kelly what we actually did was martin signed into the zoom room on his phone from the wings during the theater interval and we had a kind of like backstage chat with martin live during the the interval and we could see in the background sort of people moving around in the wings of the theater and it was it was something that you would never do you'd never go to a theater and then just pop backstage for a quick chat in you know in the break so it was something that we could do that made it kind of unique to the online experience which actually Kat gave me a couple of brilliant tips on on that one of them was don't forget to talk to the online audience and and anyone that's doing this the thing that can be different difficult if you've got more than one camera is if you want to talk to a camera you don't necessarily know which one's live so some either you need to talk to your camera operators so they get you and you just pick one uh, or you need to know at least at the beginning but i think it it was something i wouldn't have thought to do i think naturally there's a lot of adrenaline about having an audience and it's easy to to forget about the online audience so you you kind of and your desire as a performer is really to you know you want to please all these people that are in the room with you so um it's really good to be reminded of that and to remember to address the online audience specifically. Um, the other thing that uh, that Live to Your Living Room suggested and that the space uh, also helped us think about was we had one like a wide lock off from the back of the room so that you could see the audience during applause. And I think that does make a difference as well in terms of, it, yes, that, I suppose that could be as live. It could be a pre-recorded audience, but it seems to help in real time to make you feel connected to that that other audience. Um, but the thing in the interval for me, I loved it, and I would encourage any anybody that that's here that is going to do something like this to to jump on that. It felt quite special to have this thing that was just for the online audience, um, and it was also slightly insane. Like there wasn't quite time to do it and, and like Kat says there was like a, a very quick makeup change happening like and so it, it was uh I think those things are the genuine advantages of of streamed work because you can get a camera backstage you can't as Kat says take an audience backstage um but you can also answer direct questions in a way that so we did this little Q&A and, and people asked questions and um Good moderators are vital, I would say, in all of this. So you, you, I couldn't have done it on my own, and I would strongly suggest nobody tries to do it on their own. Um, yeah. you, so you much like some... here, our audience are, are sending in questions, and then our event host kind of filters the appropriate ones out. So there's, there's quite a lot. This is kind of come back to Natalie's point about more, more. There's more things to think about. There's more people, isn't there? There's a lot of people involved in all of this. And thinking about all the roles and think you said something about that to me before Kat you know so we really think about all the people that you have involved yeah and there's a lot of coordination I think we had two whatsapp chats going where where we had one for our online crew and then one that linked uh, a, me and the technical manager up with the lyceum crew so that we weren't sort of because there's about 15 people in the in the main Lyceum chat and then there was another kind of eight of us who were stewarding the online stuff so we we have volunteer stewards who come and 
manage the events with us so if anybody's talking or or accidentally left their mics on then our stewards will go and uh, you know click mute or they'll if they have a technical problem or want to know how to stream it to their telly then our stewards are there to sort of help support that but having them in the main big chat when we're trying to link up with the the venue crew as well was really overwhelming so then I was the sort of link between the two chats and passing things on and queuing from one to the other and um you know it was it was quite complex but it was tremendous fun good let's should we see if there's if there's any questions from the audience particularly to Kat and Martin just give it a minute so we've got um one or two people in the audience are talking about their experience of, of doing similar things which is really interesting but is, I think I'm just wondering we haven't got any specific questions yet but if anybody does have any please put them in now and I'll kind of carry on because I've got a, I just wanted to kind of carry on with Kat for a minute so we've we've talked about and and Natalie touched on this idea of, sort of audience expectations and you you, you know, you, you've talked to me about the fact that you have live to your living room already has a sort of a, a loyal fan base, shall we say. And then other people are finding you because you work with different artists. Somebody comes because they are a fan of an artist, then find your work and maybe goes to other your performances. And so that, that you think that those, you, you sort of regard those audiences having slightly different expectations of you. And when we talk about production values, what, what do you think are really, what's helpful in, helping you to meet audience expectations? It's a tricky one and it's one that we're still sort of grappling with really because as the art sector continues to be kind of unpredictable uh, and COVID doing what it does, we're, we're trying to sort of navigate our way through this and we're not in the point where we're in full lockdown and everybody just accepts, uh, like as Natalie said at the beginning, the, the people were accepting a much lower quality of production value because it was all about the connection. And that was the important part. That was the bit that they were seeking from it. Whereas now further down the line, I've said so what I was chatting to you before is so that the people that have been with us from the beginning are so invested in the concept of life, you know, one of whom is Martin, <laughs> so invested in the concept of life to a living room that they've, they've come on the journey with us. And it, and, and to them, it, they don't really mind like, cause, because they, they're used to they know what we do and they know what we're about but but yeah somebody who's kind of discovered us more recently won't have the backstory and also there's that confusion as you were saying and Natalie was saying about there's live and there's live live because there's a lot of stuff that is billed as live which is pre-recorded um as live and so trying to explain to people who are complaining about you know video quality or it keeps breaking up or things like that trying to sort of explain yes it's a live performance i can't control the internet in your house uh, so i can't make the quality any better for you at the moment and you know i don't have the budget of strictly calm dancing to do full live tv production values it's it's a difficult kind of like middle ground at the moment people are wanting more but not necessarily there isn't the same kind of feel as there was in lockdown where it was all about supporting the artists and building the community it's that it's kind of flipped back to more of a consumer model and so we're having to look at how we change our model um to account for that so one of the things that we always said right through is that we don't record our performances live was our usp and it was all about being in the room connecting with people being together in the space and actually we've we've been discussing well since the start we've been discussing this but more and more recently that's not really ticking the box anymore for people because that's not why they're coming to us and we're, we're leaning more and more towards okay we are going to have to look into how are we going to record these and make them available uh in other ways without taking away from the live aspect will it work how, how do we make it work how do we increase our production values to to kind of give people what they're expecting whilst still operating on a really tiny budget. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and this, all of that. It, it, thank you, Kat. And what, there's a sort of conversation going on in the chat as well. We're sort of talking about the sort of the relationships and how and how that's all changing as well. So it's interesting to hear you saying sort of moving to more of the sort of consumer model in order to respond to the people who you don't have that intimate relationship with already. Was it Martin, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, it's, I, 
it's been interesting looking at the the shift both as a as a maker and as an audience member and um i think so there are a couple of things that that have stayed with me i think and with a lot of people one is that we discovered a lot of audience members with with various access requirements that we didn't know about that uh, by no means were all physical that that i think a lot of performers um were were unaware that, that there was this keen audience that they that they weren't getting and i think a, there is a desire to to keep providing for that audience um i think the the thing that cat's talking about as we as the option is there to go out and we get so used to the quality of tv and the buzz of just anything happening that we had in lockdown you know anything that happened seemed so miraculous and special that it was great and also there was a slightly voyeuristic thing of like you're in somebody's actual house and you can look at their bookshelf when they're playing and stuff and all of that had a magic to it i think it is harder now um it's one of the things that i've always loved about life to your living room that it is actually live because uh i actually found i i watch more stuff then otherwise i go i'll watch that later and i don't so I sort of maybe prefer it as myself as an audience member, but I do understand in a consumer model why you do it. But but I just wanted to touch on people quickly because I think there is a huge difference for us in Kelly and everything else we've done to life to your living room. So the show, the May Day show that that Kat mentioned, we did have uh, maybe four different participants in different bits of the UK zooming in, and the beauty of the live to your living room zoom model is that was really easy to do because it's literally people joining a zoom call and that that's wonderful we had eliza carthy on the cliffs at whitby and we had morris dancers in stroud on a hill as the sun comes up that if you were going to do that as tv you know you're looking at hundreds of thousands of pounds to make that happen so there is something to be cherished about this diy thing but what we did with Kelly felt partly that the Lyceum is a high production theatre and they are interested in presenting a certain idea of themselves to the world, quite understandably. Um, so for a start, that didn't seem like quite the right fit. Um, uh, and and this, I have to say the space have been hugely helpful in helping us work out how many people you might really need. But the vital things I would say to people are you need two sets of humans, one looking at a live show and one looking at a, a streamed show. And it is, it's unfair on those people, on those technicians to ask them to do both at once. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, for example, we've got a live brass band in a room who are very loud. So we've got a live engineer mixing for the room. There's almost no brass band in that PA because it's so loud in the room. If you were to take that desk mix straight to the people at home, you would get almost 100% actor's voice and no brass band because that's what's coming through that PA. So it really needs another human mixing that, which means you have somehow to split whatever it is, 48 channels of audio somewhere. You need a whole desk somewhere. And then you need physically somewhere to put them, which sounds really obvious. But actually, if they're in a room with a brass band, it's pretty hard for them to guess what it's going to sound like in a different room without a brass band so those you know and that's before we get into cameras and um so what we did was to have multi-camera and and a live edit and we were very lucky that that our show director comes from film and she sat with at, at the mixer you know at the vision mixer and called the edit which is really useful because we didn't have time to rehearse with that crew like you might on a TV show, you know. Um, so uh, I suppose I'm echoing Natalie's point right at the beginning. Um, I love doing things live and, and I do think there's a buzz about it, but it, it is definitely doing two things at once and actually, therefore, you need more people. Um, and you need each one, each one looks after their own thing, doesn't it? I remember we had a, a whole big thing with Kelly at one point where um, Shona, the tenor horn player, had in the camera shot, had a shadow, the shadow of the bell of her horn 
was right over her face. Whereas in the theater, you, you didn't notice that it, it wasn't obvious, but from our camera shot, it was massively obvious so that her face was really dark. Um, so we had to, we spent ages trying to work out how to adjust the lighting to, to show that. So lighting is a key thing, isn't it? And I think when we get, when, Ma when Magnus comes on, so he'll talk, he'll go into some more details about some of the practicalities. And I think we'll probably come back to that conversation. Um, is there anything else? Is there any other sort of really key points you think that made this a success? I think okay. oh, no, I was just going to say I think we've I think we've covered most things. So there's, but just to kind of reiterate the the teamwork, the communication. If if I had to just pick one thing, that's that's what it would be. Yeah, teamwork. Yeah. And, and Martin, what about for you? Um, I I loved this buzz of live and I really liked feeling like there was this engagement with the live audience and I, I think it would have been a complete uh, with the online audience I think it would have been a completely different experience for me either just filming it and putting it out or not having had these pointers of remember your online audience and and to engage with them directly um uh, one of the superstars of Kelly is actually here in this webinar, uh, Tam Dean Burnt. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hello, Tam. Tam has a question. So he's, he's uh, Tam saying he was in Kelly, such great fun, and sort of, and saying the question that he wants to ask is how do you ensure that sound and vision are really in sync? I think well, we have to throw that to Magnus later. Yeah. <laughs> I have someone who deals with that. Fine, 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 fine. So that's it. We'll, we'll we'll get we'll get to that with Magnus. I just talk really slowly and hope that. It... <laughs> okay, and um, and then there was one other question, which is just sort of going back to this idea of having somebody as the moderator in the in the in the mix. How do you find that person? So we're talking about sort of two teams, and you've got a moderator who's really engaging with the audience. What kind of qualities are you looking for? How do you find that person to do that? Um, uh, the kind of the event host, you mean? Hmm. Yeah. So we we treat it like an MC in a in a venue gig. Uh, so for for a folk audience, it's quite normal to have uh, somebody hosting and introducing the artist and that kind of thing. So there's an there's an element of uh, performance and that you have to be comfortable speaking to the audience and you have to be able to sort of vamp and fill gaps if there are any but there's also an element of stage management in it so uh, again kind of in the folk genre you you'd you know you'd be in the upstairs room of a pub or something you, you don't have a full-on production team so the MC kind of does the stage management uh, and the timekeeping and, and all of that at the same time as the sort of audience interaction so whereas it's a slightly complex role it's one that's familiar to us in our genre so we we have a kind of a host of people who are used to doing that kind of thing um we um, and we train them we train them on using zoom we we give them a, a sort of a guidelines of these are the things that we want you to say the, um you know here's some suggestions of how to talk about things we let them um kind of work alongside another mc or event host if they if they want to kind of a bit of support as they as they learn how to do it I think yeah. live delivery rooms uh, MCs are really enthusiastic, and I think it's worth remembering that that's very hard because they're usually on a room alone. And I think that's, you know, if you're that sort of person, that's not too hard in a room full of people that you get something back. But actually, it's a real skill to keep to keep that up um, when there's when there's nobody there, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, fair play to them. I think um, so. What you're talking about, we'll we'll finish here. Just it really echoes what we talked about. You, know, this is about detail, isn't it? Really thinking through all the practicalities and really thinking about the details and how you make this into an excellent um, experience for everybody. Mm, really, experience is the yeah. word. Experience. Okay, and I'm going to save that one because we're going to have a break now, and then I think we'll get we'll get back to talking about the audience experience, and we'll do that after we've heard from Magnus, who's going to answer. As he said, he's got a long and a short answer to the question about sound and vision. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for telling us all about Kelly. Um, we're going to take a five minute screen break now, everybody. So we'll be back at 11.45, then we'll hear from Magnus and then we'll have all, all of the panelists back together.
Okay, so you can turn yourselves off for now and we'll reconvene. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're ready to start again. I'm going to ask Magnus to join us now. And as he said earlier, um, Magnus is going to use some case studies and examples of pieces that he's worked on to sort of uh, unpick some of the sort of critical thinking and the important factors in making a really good live, live creation. Thanks, Magnus. Over to you. Okay. Hi everyone. So I'm I'm just going to go straight into um, my examples of live streams that, that I've been involved with or, or I've produced. Um, so we kind of get the most out of it, not too much waffle. Hopefully, um, they are two of them are live live streams, and one of them was an as live, which I know I'm not really supposed to be talking about, but I think it sometimes helps to to see the reasons why it wasn't. It could have been live. There were arguments both ways, so I think it's an interesting one. And uh, you know, I think everyone's going to understand why it didn't go out live, which is just important, I think. So my first example was a poetry competition, um, which was called Poetry Slam, and it was at the uh, Royal Albert Hall in London. And it was a live event, a real event in a room with an audience. Um, but it was a competition with voting that happened um, you know during the during the show so there were there were a number of rounds and at the end of each round the audience in the room voted on who they wanted to eliminate uh for the next round and it was very quick fire and it was very exciting you know it's a bit like you know a bit like the x factor something like that so um they wanted to live stream it and you can ask natalie um why that was i'm not totally sure i I mean, it may be a kind of pandemic related thing because it could have existed without the live stream and it has run previously without a live stream. Um, so that would be a, an interesting question. But certainly once a decision had made to live stream it, um, it needed the audience needed to have the audience participation element so that they could actually take part in the voting, I would say essential. Otherwise, the audience would have felt very disconnected just like watching it, other people vote and not, not having any, any connection. So um, if you're going to put it out at all, I think in this case, it has to be live and as live would have been really flat. Um, so um, the, the challenge was in this case to have very, very well organized audience participation kind of plan so people could vote using YouTube, the, you know, the, the, the options came up on screen that needed to come up at exactly the right time. They needed to click on who they wanted to vote. Then that data needed to be um, transferred in the room physically to the person who was calculating the results of that round. And all this needed to happen within minutes so that the person on stage 
could then announce who was uh, going forwards and who wasn't. Um, and, you know, it was a logistical kind of nightmare in a way. But the, but the fact that the, the planning was done brilliantly and it, it was it was such a it was such a well prepared and well organized event that it was seamless and as a result absolutely brilliant like a huge buzz around it i'm sure that the audience at home re really genuinely felt like they were involved in the show and their votes mattered and the person on the stage was referring to to them i forgot to put my timer on that means i'm going to be talking forever um I'll keep and, your timing. Okay, definitely. you'll tell me. Great, great. Um, and the other, the other thing um, I just want to mention with this one, I, I guess that the, the reason for mentioning this particular example here is that it was, it had to be live. Okay, you, you couldn't have done it as live. And my next, my next uh, examples can be slightly different. Um, and I think the the interesting thing about the way this was done to make it actually work, you know, just going into the technical sides just very slightly, was the logistics of it and the communication between all the parties involved. So we had, for example, things like we had a there's a very simple thing that that any, anybody can do if you've got an iPad, and you've got a Google Doc uh, up on a laptop somewhere and somebody types in information on that Google Doc, it could be an Excel, could be a Word, it pops up in real time on that iPad. It's just a tiny little simple thing that means the person on the, the, the present on the stage could have an iPad and they get real time updates on like the data which is being calculated by someone else in the room. Things like that needed to be worked out in advance. The presenter had an IEM so we could talk to him as as we went through updating on timings and when he was live and when he wasn't live um and things like that right i'm going to move on because i want to i kind of want to just get all this out and then hopefully this will make you uh, uh, think oh that's that particular point yeah that does is relevant to my show or you know i'd, I'd like to know more about that ra rather than me go into enormous detail that perhaps you know another example will be more more useful um, so my second example is a very different one. Um, it was a, a theatre show by November Club called Food and Feuds. Um, Food and Feuds, Two Cooks of Hexham. And it, it was about, they do lots of work with this historical chef called Hannah Glass. Um, and potentially, I guess, a, a theatre show about a historical character could be a little dry. And they came up with the most incredible idea, I, I would say, of um, producing a modern day cookery program and kind of time traveling Hannah Glass to the present day. So it was a modern day cookery program with a historical character kind of put in there and, and Hannah Glass was you know, a bit confused by what a camera was. And so there was loads of fun, fun around that. Um, and so it was like a, a, a magazine show where they were discussing you know, things about Hannah Glass. They brought another historical chef forwards in time who was kind of a rival at the time so there's loads of fun discussions and there was live cooking and and you could have just kept that could have just been it you know it worked as a show standalone show like that and actually did did go out in in on other days as just a, a live show and there was obviously an audience in the room um, but on this one occasion they wanted to live stream it and I think very clever because what really what they did was the live stream was an extension of the concept for the show. So it wasn't so much, let's just stream the show so people can watch it at home. The live stream was an, an, an intrinsic element of the show. So it's a cookery program. So the idea was, well, let's live broadcast the cookery program. So now the people watching it uh, at home are on the, on the stream are essentially the viewers of the live stream the viewers of the cookery program the people in the room uh, the audience in the room are the studio audience and the people on the stage you know the performers were playing along with this that there's like the start of the show there was a three two one live and all that kind of fun around it being like a real tv show um and i thought it was it was fun it was really interesting and i, I guess the key that i want to make with this example is it's it's the buzz I think was the the deep reason why they did it the buzz of it being live because you could have just filmed it and you could have put it out later and it essentially would have been the same thing but so much fun came from 
being part of a, a live cookery program with a time traveling, you know, all of that element made it really, really enjoyable. Also for the people in the room, because the people in the room were now a kind of studio audience. And it was real. We had cameras and it was really going out. We had a monitor so they could see the live stream edit in the room. And there was a clock with the, you know, the count up and all of all of that um, really made it exciting for the, the room audience as well. Um, and my third example is of um, not not live as live. So during the pandemic, as everyone knows, lots of theatre shows and events were put online purely. So we got involved in doing a lot of live um, streaming and live capture of works where there wasn't an audience and we maybe film them over a number of days, edit it, and it would go out VOD and they would sell tickets. Fine, works, works brilliantly. Then as audience started to go back, I think a lot of venues started thinking, well, we, we should carry this on because actually it's a very powerful way of reaching a bigger audience and we're archiving our shows. There's just loads of you know, accessibility reasons. It, it makes so much sense. But the, th the particular theatre that we work with a lot decided to um, move towards a live capture rather than the previous way we've been doing it, maybe filming a, an over a number of days or filming a number of shows and editing them together. They, they thought, well, it's, it's theatre, it should be live, let's just film a, a live show. And, and at that point, it could have been a live stream easily. So we, we essentially, we've got them, all the cameras in the room, we have live editing, someone's doing a live audio mix, all the elements are there. All we need us to do is encode that and put it out. And it would have been a live stream. You record it and that goes out for the rest of the run. However, and this is, you know, I can hear Natalie in, in my head here saying, um, you know, are you sure? Is that the best way to do it? And the, the reasons why they decided not to do it were really the, the safety net, uh, mostly, which I think Natalie mentioned that if something had gone wrong in, in a particular performance, then that's, that's there forever, you know? And, and it's been mentioned before, there's a lot more, um, I think there's a more understanding that if something's genuinely live, it isn't gonna be polished. But, but the point remains that you have like maybe a mistake in your show and you're selling tickets to it and it's gonna go out perhaps for the rest of the run for two weeks. So, yeah, so the decision was make, made to film it live and then have one day. And that meant that we could make some refinement edits. The sound could be improved because if anyone's been involved in theater sound, it's extremely difficult to uh, have a, a tight mix, you know. Um, and, and we could do a bit of grading and we could put credits on the end and tighten all the timings up. Also, they wanted the interval to be included so um, we included it, but we, re we reduced it. I'm gonna talk a, a bit about dog ears in a second. So, um, and then it, it went out as live. So at 7.30, you know, two days after that performance, it goes out as a live stream and people watch it uh, at the same time as the real show's going on. So it feels live possibly, but you know, it, it technically isn't live. Um, and I think I think we can all we can all sympathise as to why they did that. Um, I mean, I love live. I love live streams. I love being involved in them. And I think what you gain from that is a much more polished, refined product, which works as an archive, which works as something that is shown day after day after day, um, and it works because you've got so many creatives involved that they watch it and everybody likes it. And if somebody watches it and the director says, oh, actually, you know, I really don't like the way that that happened. Can we fix it? You can fix it. And so everybody is generally happy. You can imagine if, if it if it went out genuinely live and then on the second day, the director's like, well, you can't put that out anymore because, you know, that that's that's on my show, you know, and I'm not happy with it. So you've got that that risk there. Um, right. So what I've what I've got now is a list of things that I think become extremely important when you're, you're putting something out live, um, which may still be a factor if you're 
filming the show just to be captured, but are less important. And, you know, there's, there's so much I could talk about, but, but these are things that need to be covered however you're filming something. So I'm really going to focus in on, like, if it's live, these things are become ex extremely critical. Um, and my first thing is timing. Um, I think I, I came up with a, a slightly silly metaphor here because it, it, I think it's like dog years and human years, like live stream minutes are kind of like 10 times as long as a, as a real minute. You know, so if you say you're in a theater and you're watching a show, uh, you know, for real, and the show is a minute late, well, you barely notice that. That's like nothing. It could be 10 minutes late and you would perhaps look at your watch and go, oh, it's a little late, but it's no big deal. Well, a minute on a live stream, if you're told it starts at 7.30 and everyone's sitting there and there's a holding slide saying starting at 7.30 and you sit for an entire minute waiting, that's a long time. That is the equivalent of you looking at your phone going, oh, this is a bit late, just one minute. So imagine 10 minutes sitting in front of your laptop and 10 minutes is not unreasonable for, a, I've been to plenty theater that starts 10 minutes late. 10 minutes in front of a, a blank screen, you, you'll probably lose half your audience. Um, so time becomes extremely critical. I think, think about this like the dog years thing. Everything matters like 10 times more than it normally does. Every break, every kind of pause, especially if you've got like a, you know, a presenter led show, you know, plan it so that the presenter doesn't, you know, wait three minutes off stage until they come back on. You know, it needs to be quick fire. That uh, Poetry Slam event was one of the best I've done like that. It was just, it never stopped. There was, there was music playing and then there was a presenter on the screen and it just, it was brilliant. Um, and then the interval I mentioned before, we, we reduced the interval for those shows so that they feel like 20 minutes, but of course they weren't 20 minutes, they were only a few minutes long. But um, like we just, you just had a five minute break, right? That's kind of the equivalent of a, a 20 minute theater interval. Um, the communication becomes so much of a, a critical thing as well, communication between the crew. So we always have comms so that the multicam director can talk to all the camera operators. We have IEMs, like I mentioned earlier, like iPads with synced documents so we can communicate. So everybody knows exactly what's happening. Somebody has to decide to start the show. And, you know, the, 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 the multicam director might be ready and the person who's starting the show is not sure whether we're live and whether we're ready. And then you can, lo you can lose five minutes with that confusion. So we need to you need to have a concrete plan for how the whole thing's going to start, you know, what the communication procedure is. Um, having IEMs and, you know, mics that you can talk in people's ears brilliant but um, this is all kit that you know might not be possible but just the, the principles are the same there are lots of different ways of doing it um this is what we often do iems and um comm systems audience participation is brilliant and if you can do it you should do it but don't underestimate what a massive thing it is these enormous amounts of pre-planning and and thought like how are you going to do it how are you going to get the data how are you going to collate it is someone going to to choose the questions to then feed to the presenter? Are they gonna get everything? Are they gonna be on stage like reading through 15 questions? Just think it all through and have a really concrete plan for how you're going to get that participation, uh, process it and pass it on to whoever needs to have it really quickly. Um, this, this conference, this webinar is a great example of that. I posted something earlier and, and Linda mentioned it almost immediately. It, it's been thought through and it works and, and there's no delays and everything is, you know, working, working smoothly. Um, live captioning. We just mentioned this, didn't we, in the, in the comments. So uh, if you just made a film and then you were going to put it out VOD, captioning is, is just so simple. You just you just send it off to Rev, get the captions, SRTs, bung them up, they're done. It just costs you, you know, 15, 20 quid, no problem live captioning a whole different thing now it's absolutely possible there's loads of different ways to do it it's been mentioned there's auto captioning you can hire brilliant people who will literally i think i'm probably talking too fast but we'll you know somebody can say whether she's keeping up um 
But you know, there's brilliant solutions out there, but but they're much more complicated. They're much more expensive. They need planning. They need to be thought through. Whereas, you know, if it's not live, uh, you can almost just worry about it later. BSL, we've done live BSL where you you have a camera dedicated to filming a BSL interpreter on the stage and you can put them in a box in the corner. Works brilliantly, but it's very expensive and obviously costs and and takes a lot of time and planning. You need another camera uh, and you need to have the, the capability to live kind of key somebody down into a box. Um, I'm, I'm skipping through because I'm sure I'm out of time or almost am. The, um, yeah, it was mentioned about publicizing event. If you film an event, like we filmed a show Little Space a while ago and um, we filmed it over a number of days and we edited it and we graded it and everyone's happy with it. And then we made a trailer and then they begin the publicizing of that. Uh, you know, and they've got a trailer and they've got stills and all this great stuff from the actual product itself. Well, if it's live, then it doesn't exist until afterwards. So then we're in the realms of, well, do, do you need to actually have a little shoot to film some materials like way before you even begin and then use that to publicize the events? Do you want to get some interviews with the performers or the director to put stuff out? You need stills. There's so much stuff that really you should have to publicize that event in advance of the event itself existing. The Poetry Slam, uh, kind of an easy one because it had existed before and there was footage and there was images. So, but not all events are like that, right? Sometimes things are quite unique. Um, and so that's a challenge and ultimately a, a cost. Um, if you are live editing, then you really need, well, I would suggest you have a multicam director or vision mixer, or that could be the same person or two different people that know the show, know the event and have planned uh, like like when we're filming a, a live theatre piece, for example, we've we've spent a week. You know, we watched the show. We've we've uh, created a shooting script, which notates exactly what camera's going to do what at what point, and we've sometimes even rehearsed it through, so that when we get to the show, we can we can get as close as possible to a polished, finished, refined film live. And if you don't do that. Like if you just sit down and just try and live edit something that you that you don't you're not expecting things to happen, it'll work, but it will be very far from refined unless unless you're extremely quick. So again, it's just expense, it's work, it's pre-planning. Uh, we often, when we when we're filming a theatre show, have a scratch recording that's perhaps a, a rehearsal that's not identical, but close enough. So we use the script and a scratch recording to plan it all. And then we maybe attend like the show, like the, the press night, which is maybe the night before we film. So there's days and days and days of uh, work before the actual, the actual shoot day. Um, so I could probably stop now, I'd probably run out of time. I've got a little bit about the kit that's kind of additional, like what, what kind of kit that you, need on a live stream as opposed to if it's just a capture do, um, do, do that and then we'll nip quickly to the questions i think that'd be really helpful to cover the so, kit. yeah so in the, the simplest way if you were filming a show you could have a videographer with a camera and you could spend a number of days filming different angles different elements of it and then you could go into the edit for a number of weeks and edit the show right it, it there are lots of different ways of doing it from that small scale up to you know, a massive live multicam. Um, but if it is actually live, you kind of need lots of cameras. Uh, you need uh, ideally a comms system so that the whoever's doing the directing can talk to the cameras, tell them what to do. Because assume that the camera operators aren't going to study the show and know everything about it. So you, you, you've got to kind of be their, their brains. We we use a tally system. So I think Martin mentioned that early, earlier, like, if you need to know what camera is live at any one time, we've got a tally system with a light on the top. The camera operators know if they're live and if they're not live, they can reframe. If you ever watch a live show and suddenly the camera just moves abruptly and then, then the cut away, it's because there's been a fault like with somebody not knowing that they're live. Um, and that can happen a lot if you don't have any kind of tally system at all, because the, the cameras are just guessing, you know. Um, you need, you need a vision mixer. Somebody needs to actually live edit the show. And that is a 
piece of kit and obviously a, a human who knows how to do it. So potentially you don't need that if you're just doing an as live. And then you need a live encoder, which is probably a computer run, running OBS or I use wire, wire, uh, Wirecast to encode the video live and put it out to YouTube or Facebook. And, uh, and there's the sync question, which I need another 25 minutes to answer that. Is that all right? <laughs> no. What's the super quick version? So the super quick version is if you if you've got um, somebody doing a sound mix on a desk, and then you've got an RTEM, so you've got all your video coming into the RTEM, and you've got your sound. The sound is usually real time. You don't really get delays with sound, so you plug your sound into your RTEM, and then so the video and the sounds going into the RTEM is a vision mix, by the way. At the same time, when they go in there, they're both in sync. So the video is instant, pretty much, and the audio is instant. And then that's where they get mucked together. So in, in theory, what then comes out the other end is in sync. So if you just set it up right, it should be in sync. Now, the long answer, which I obviously won't go into, is it's not that simple. Sync is one of the, the biggest problems with live streaming. And they're just, it's a bit of a dark art. There's just endless things that can go wrong that, that puts your video out of sync. And sometimes it's not you, it's not your setup that you're actually putting it out fine. It's actually the, the platform that you're going to is doing it. You've got issues with frame rate. If you're doing a 25 frames per second live stream, which is what we operate on in this country, we're a 25 frames per second country or 50 hertz country. Um, live streams, I think, all run at 60 hertz, 30 frames. Um, you don't need to understand that. The point is, it's different. It's an American system, and we have our own system because I don't know why we shouldn't really have different systems. So at some point, someone has to convert your 25 to 30. And that is a source of problems because the audio and the video, although you kind of assume that they're like stuck together, they're not. They, they get sent a bunch of audio and a bunch of video. And then at a certain point, they're like, okay, here's another bunch of audio and a bunch of video. They should be in sync at this point. And, and sometimes it just, it just doesn't work and things get out of sync. Sometimes you find it's, it's a, a compression problem, H.264. Um, is the compression format that that um, live streaming works at, and that is it's just a very bad codec for tying audio. If you ever notice on YouTube, you sometimes flick to maybe halfway through a video, so say a long video, so you flick to an hour in. This even happens with like VLC sometimes. You flick to it; it has to the software has to figure out. Okay, an hour in, let's go through all the audio. An hour in, that should be there. All the video, an hour in, that should be there. So these two points should be uh, in sync and they're not because it they're not tied together like that. It's not like audio, video, audio, video, audio, video, like a frame and the audio next to it, like it, like film, for example, you know, where they used to print it. It could never be out of sync. Audio is not like that. It's like having a, a stream of videotape and a stream of audio uh, cassette tape laid on the floor um, separate. And, and, you know, they're not always in, in, in line. It so sounds, it sounds like you could do a kind of whole webinar on audio, really saying audio is not like that, a world of its own. It is, it is. And almost, I'd say it's almost the, the most important thing about certain, certain live streams, the video is kind of the easy part. You know, you, you can pretty much even just a, just a, a phone, you know, just bung a phone there. Um, and you're going to get really good quality video very easily. Um, but audio, say you've got a single phone and it's a huge theater show with 10 cast and well, audio is your problem. How on earth do you capture everybody like really intelligibly? Um, you could live stream a theater show with, with a phone, but if you just let the phones deal with the audio, that, that would be a problem, I think. So which is one of the questions we were asked in advance was about how do you film dynamically with how it was put with a phone but you're saying it's it's the audio you have to give attention to if you're doing yeah. something on a very low at the low cost end if you ignore that so the, the question is about filming dynamically on a phone so we just take the question literally in a sense 
it it's it is dynamic you know because it's a phone and you can move it around and you can do whatever you want with it i guess that the point is if you have a single camera whatever kind of camera and you bung it on a tripod and you make a nice wide shot and you press live stream and and then you perform in front of it it's going to be not dynamic it's going to be quite dull to watch that um the moment that you pick up a phone and move around the room with it it's dynamic now it's actually easier to do that with a phone than it is say like a huge camera with a human behind it and a you know a, an sdi cable going to a, a vision mixer and all that kind of stuff so in a way phones are very dynamic um if you've got some money go and buy a gimbal you can get very cheap gimbals which are like you, you hold the bottom right and then you put the phone in the top and it keeps it completely um stabilized as you move around and so you're you're now essentially you're like a steady cam you can float around your show beautifully you can live stream straight from the phone without um you know without cables and encoders and stuff so in a sense it's it is very dynamic um i guess what you lose is all of the the refinement of having multiple angles you lose the ability to have a complex audio mix being done you know somewhere being fed to your stream uh, there's 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 all kind of things you lose but what you do gain i think is dynamism actually and um, and Kat, Kat's made a good point which we we talked about earlier about the whole this whole life being an opportunity for people who don't have access to um yeah in the you know in in theater or in venue experiences she's talking about people some people really struggle with moving cameras and that's the thing to be mindful of isn't it i mean it's it's such a huge huge thing isn't it like there's we, we made a show where they wanted to create a um a different version which was like an, a more accessible version that had less camera cuts and I think the sound mix was done slightly differently. And, and I think we could actually do that fairly easily because we just, we, we, you know, we have your wide shot and then you have all the other angles. You could actually just put out your wide shot with really well mixed audio and subtitles and BSL and that goes out and it's, that's a brilliant version for some people. That's what they would want. And then, you know, there are some people out there that, that wants a visual extravaganza and they want close ups and they want to see all kinds of things. So I think, yeah, it's like you can do everything, can't you? If you've got the resources and it's, it's, it's brilliant when that does happen and when you can make different versions and you've got live BSL and you've got captioning and, and uh, then you reach, you know, your maximum audience, I guess. But it's, um, thank you for all of that. So we, we've had a, we had a question about issues with platforms, which Kat has given an answer to, and you'd also talked about maybe that's where the audio and the, the, <laughs> the video kind of come apart, as it were, or don't link together. Let's just see if there's any other, I'm going to see if there's any other questions from the audience, and then I'll bring the, the other panellists back in again, Magnus, and just, and just for, you could take a second if you want just to is there anything else you really really wanted to get across it we, we ran out of time is there anything that you haven't said that was on your priority really want to tell people about just the, any the only thing which is not I, just, I, I missed it out because it's not very important but just just a tiny little extra note that if you're doing a live stream it's good to have all of your starting soon banners and your end credits and your thumbnail and all those materials, like almost every time I, I know it sounds stupid that obviously you all know this. Every time I do a live stream, I have to bug the client to like, please give me a like, it's starting soon banner, you know, nicely designed. It, without that, how, how do we start? You know, it's just black screen and then suddenly we're in the room. So it's those little things uh, like really add a sheen of kind of refinement. Okay, that's, lovely. that's all that I missed off. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to bring the others back in and just see if they've got any, because I think we're really sort of talking about how do you make it's a really beautiful experience if you're making the most of life. Just whether anybody else has any other thoughts on that, on those the sort of little details that make the difference. Can I jump in quickly? Because I was you? just about to post a comment um, directly from what Magnus has just said. It's absolutely essential to have those kind of details in it. And we, uh, we, instead of a static slide we actually run a slideshow and uh we 
we scroll around a few different slides, one of which is it's starting soon. This is who's playing tonight. But um, the others are things like, if you have any technical questions with Zoom, this is what you can do. Here is how to pin a video in Zoom. Here is how to do this. Here is our Facebook page. Here is our Twitter handle, kind of just kind of like scrolling round and round. And we have found it's it has decreased the number of technical questions we get, which are along the lines of how do I pin a video? Um, just because we've got that kind of scrolling as people go and it, it has massively helped us as well as them. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Martin, do you have any particular well, I was, detail hints that you'd give to people? I, I was actually just going to echo something that had come up in the chat. Um, so Matt Elliott, and um, I, coincidentally, I've done a lot of work with Matt. Matt's actually done a lot of work with Kat as well. Um, and, uh, and a shout out to Matt, because he is a hero of arts streaming. But um, audio is paramount, he's, he's saying. And I do, I would just echo that. Like um, I, I think we really um we need belief as audiences we need to have confidence in the thing that that we're being presented so that we can kind of wholeheartedly enjoy it and for some reason I, and i don't know why audio seems to be more comforting or when the audio is not right we are we feel unhappy much more quickly than a, a bit of a glitchy video which we're prepared to forgive um and and i i'm just agreeing with uh, with Magnus that that is something hard to get right on a phone because um, it's just one microphone and it's also in a kind of stupid place a lot of the time for, for what you're doing you know if you're you're a long way away getting your shot beautiful um, and it doesn't need to cost a fortune to up that a little bit um, Matt actually recently bought a couple of these road uh, microphones that they're very quick uh, and, and they've changed a lot of what we do. They just clip on things and they go over radio and you can stick them straight into a camera, which makes it useful, but it means your microphone's now here with your, with your person. And I suppose, uh, I, I'm guessing in terms of who's here in the audience, but we were really lucky with Kelly at the scale that we got to work with. But that I think is, um, is, is a lucky exception rather than the norm of, of what people get get to do when, when they're streaming. And so a lot of the time you are looking so much at reducing cost. Um, and um, yeah, a couple of microphones close to the things that are making noise make a big difference. Thank you. Um, what we, oh, I was, oh, oh, sorry, Linda, I was just going to, is that okay if I just- Yes, and then I'll go to that after that. Um, I was just going to say what we do with our standard kind of gigs is we actually post out a mixing desk to artists uh a, like just a little um i'm going to forget the name of it now it's like a behringer x16 something like that have i got that right magnus yeah <laughs> um right. and so the artists in their in their homes or wherever they're performing plug into the behringer and we also send them a little laptop with it and then our tech manager uses uses team viewer to remotely access the laptop that's at their house with the with the desk and then he mixes over zoom so he doesn't need to be in the room with them he mixes the sound as the audience hear it over zoom remotely through team viewer um so it, it's been something to kind of like right from the start we need to really get the audio quality um absolutely perfect um the other thing i was just going to say is it doesn't need to be expensive you don't need masses of equipment so actually the, the behringer desk and the laptop and the flight case that we send out um, it's less than a thousand pounds. It all, all comes in together. Um, and there's other things like if we uh, if we if we want to use a phone camera to get a, to get a different a good quality camera, with the way that we do it in Zoom meeting, you can just log in on another camera as the Zoom camera, and you can pin it for the audience, or you can spotlight it and say this is this is where. The video is coming from and then the sound is is coming in from a different place but because you're in a zoom meeting you, you it's all kind of synced up for you so that there, there's kind of work there's workarounds um that, that don't have to cost cost the earth to do thank you thank you thank you and natalie if you if you've got anything you'd say about you know really enriching audience experience and then we'll uh, get to our last point well, I think what's interesting is hearing about, Kat talked about um, the slideshow, Magnus talked about holding cards, that's been reflected in the chat. 
And Martin said something really interesting about audio, giving people confidence that that's an aspect. And I think that's kind of all of it. And you wrap that up with dog ears, you know, the feeling of dog ears is brilliant, Magnus, and it is what it feels like. Because I think that's part of it for any online experience, but especially for a live one, is remembering your audience who are possibly sitting alone with a laptop in, and they're thinking, has the stream fallen over? Is this wrong? Maybe this isn't happening. And they're suddenly feeling and maybe a bit self-conscious. Is it my computer that's glitchy or is it the stream? And it's about, we talked earlier about creating atmosphere and how live can create a sense of real fun and excitement for both the people in the room, maybe a live audience, but also the performers, but also the audience at home. All these little things that give your audience confidence that you've got this, you've got in the same way your venue would be clean, you'd have a friendly front of house officer checking the tickets, you'd have somebody on the bar who can, you know, has got the ice ready for the GT at the interval, whatever it is. You're kind of trying to do that online, you know, you you've only got five minutes to wait, the interval will be 20 minutes, you've got someone to give some tech tips. If the sound is bad, you've got someone friendly in the chat to say, sorry guys, the sound's a bit off, give us two minutes. You know, it's those things with live that you're all embarking on this thing together. And for the person that's sitting on their own, kind of on their laptop, on their sofa, you kind of need to give them the, the confidence that you've got the technical stuff and they can relax. And then that's where all that fun and excitement and atmosphere comes from. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. So what we're going to do now, if this is all right, is um, we ask for, um, if you wouldn't mind to the audience, filling in an evaluation of the webinar. Just really helpful, useful information to understand what we're doing well, what we could do differently. And because all of the webinars are funded, it helps us to kind of feed back to the funders as well. So I'm going to put, um, ask Richard to put the two minutes slide up and then you'll get a link. It's only, I think it's just a few questions, four or five questions. Two minutes will be fine. Then I'll quickly come back to our speakers for a last top. If any of them have got a last top tip they want to share before we finish up, and then we'll be done at half past twelve. So just uh, just a couple of minutes, and then I'll come back to the speakers. And you might want to think: Is there one last thing you want to tell you, you would like to share with people before we finish? You can stick your turn your video off for a minute if you want to, and then I'll just carry on. Um, yeah, so just to our panelists, whether you have a last, a last thought or experience that you'd like to share with people, and just wave if, you, if there's something that you'd like to add in. And we've literally got two minutes left, so it's 30 seconds ish each. Go on, Magnus. Magnus and then Martin. I can see Magnus's mouth moving first. I was, I was just going to quote our, our county council. They've got this. Uh, policy on um, approval, you know, um, planning approvals, that if they can't think of a compelling reason not to allow something, they just allow it. <laughs> and I think for live streams, if you can't think of a compelling reason not to do it, I would say do it. Natalie probably going to disagree with me, but I think they're so brilliant. If you can do it, do it. Thank you very much. Martin, what was yours? Uh, mine was actually the same. I was, I was just going to encourage people to do things live. And to bear in mind, that means more planning, 
more people, probably more work, which which it is not what we assume perhaps sometimes, but it's a buzz. And that's the point. Brilliant. Thank you. And Kat, what would you say? Um, I agree with everything that Magnus and Martin have just said, but I'm going to drop a little bit of a bombshell. We haven't talked at all about licensing. And if you are doing music shows, then you do need to just be aware of your licensing. I mean, I could literally give you a whole webinar just on PRS licensing. Um, uh, so it, just make sure that you make sure you know what you're doing and yeah. that you take a bit of time to research that. Thank you. That's really good advice. Well remembered. Thank you. Um, Natalie, what would you like to say? Um, I think I, I probably say do it if there's a, if, I'm not sure I'm as fully, um, I think it does take precision planning, but all the things that we've discussed today are the things that will get you there. And it is a real buzz, Martin's absolutely right. Um, it just takes some precision and thinking through, you know, the time, every, every minute, every second has to be filled. So you've just got to have enough bodies and enough resources that for however long or short your show is, that can you fill in the way that you artistically would want to every second of, of that time. Thank you very much. And um, Jamie's saying a webinar on PRS licensing would be really useful. <laughs> Feels like a minefield, so that's noted. Okay, lovely. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for all your great contributions and sharing so generously your knowledge and your experience. And to, that's not just to the panelists, but also to all the people um, in the audience as well it's just really nice to hear those different conversations and people recommending and sharing so much appreciated um thank you for all your contributions everybody and enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>